Please remain standing for the reading of God's Word. I'll be reading from Hebrews chapter 12. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. I'll be reading the first three verses. It says this, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with the endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. I'll stop on those two. You may be seated. From those two verses alone, I probably will need a couple messages to get through the entire point I want to make, so I won't even be able to finish it today, because there's so much meat in that verse. There's so much meat in that passage. And what I really want to focus on tonight is fixing our eyes on Jesus. It's so simple, right? But what does the author say in Hebrews? He says, we strip off weight, we strip off sin, and how do we do this? It's right there in the text. We fix our eyes on Jesus. So I actually want to start with a personal testimony getting ready for this. So I was actually asked to speak in early September, and it's been prolonging up until now. <laughs> so picture like a duty you have to do, and you know it's coming up, and every time you're ready for it, something else happens, and you know it's coming back. So I was preparing for this, and actually when I first started preparing for this, I remember I was getting so close to speaking. It was Sunday night, and I was praying, God, give me a word. Monday night, God, give me a word. Tuesday night, God, give me a word. I got to Wednesday, and I still had no word for that message coming up on Sunday. And I, I don't like to just come up and speak. I don't just want to pick a topic. I want the anointing of the Lord on the word. I want him to speak and give me clarity over my mind and say, this is the prophetic word I have for the church in this evening. So I got to Wednesday, and I was like, Lord, I still don't have a word. And you know what the Lord told me? It was very clear. He says, you're looking to me for a word. You're not looking to me. He told me that my eyes weren't on him. It was actually on the word. I wanted more of a word from God than I wanted more of God. How many times in the church do we see that ourselves? That we want more of something from God more than we actually want God. And I want to give some examples of people in the Bible. I want to give some examples of people who actually took their eyes off of the Lord. What happened when they took their eyes off of the Lord? From sin. Check this out. Look at Peter on the water in Matthew 14. He says, Jesus, if it's you, call me out. If it's you, call me on the water. And Peter comes out, he keeps his eyes on the Lord, and for one second he looks to the left, he looks at the water, and he begins to stumble and fall. We look at another example of Thomas, right? In John chapter 20, all the disciples are, are there, and they said, we've seen the resurrection of the Lord. And Thomas says, I still don't believe it. Unless I personally see the Lord, unless I personally touch him, I will not believe. Thomas took his eyes off the Lord. We look at Mary and Martha. We look at Martha, who was in preparation, preparing the room while Jesus was there, right? And we had Mary, who was literally sitting at the feet of Jesus, gazing upon the beauty of the Lord. Martha took her eyes off of the Lord. We look at Samson, another example, who took his eyes off of the Lord and began to proclaim himself and, and choose to do what he wants in a sense rather than what Christ wanted. He took his eyes off of the Lord. And we look at Ju uh, Judas, who was walking with the Lord but took his eyes off of the Lord and in the end suffered a great consequence for it. But at the same time, all these people who took their eyes off of the Lord, minus Judas, put their eyes back on him. So I'm going to go over a few examples of these people who took their eyes off of the Lord and then afterwards put their eyes back on and what happened when they focused back on Jesus. So the title of my message tonight is Fix Your Eyes on Jesus, if you haven't realized that already. I'm going to be emphasizing that pretty heavily tonight. So I want to look at a couple examples. First, I want to look at individually and personally how we can fix our eyes on Jesus and how we take it off. And second, I want to talk about how as a church we take our eyes off of Jesus and what we can do to fix that. And finally, I'll conclude with some hope. And I'll say how we can turn our eyes back to the Lord and what the Lord will do if we do so. So 
So there's three main topics I want to emphasize one more time. Individually and personally, the church and the body, and then our hope. So first, individually and personally. This is where we find ourselves like Samson. And I'm going to be reading from Judges 14, 2 and 3. It says, Then he came up and told his father and mother, I saw one of the daughters of Philistines in Timnah. Now get her for me. But his, daughter, uh, but his father and mother said to him, Is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all our people that you can go and take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, and this is where I want to emphasize, Get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. Samson was distracted with what he wanted, not what the Lord wanted. And one of the biggest distractions, if I can say that, or what Satan uses in our lives as Christians is distraction, right? Maybe he sees that we're not going to fall into sexual morality. Maybe he sees that our fight against drugs or pornography or other things aren't, you know, something crazy or big in our life. So instead he uses distraction over certain people. He uses distraction to get our eyes off of the Lord. He uses distraction for us to not focus or meditate on him, even throughout our week, throughout our day, our workspace. Let me just give you a quick example. Again, preparing for the message. I remember I pulled my Bible out, I laid on my bed, and I was ready to spend some time with the Lord. I know we all do this, right? Everyone. And I pulled out my phone really quick. I said, let me just check an email, let me check something really quick, and I'll get back to this in one second. Bible is laying flat in front of me. I pulled out my phone. Three hours went by. And then I had to go because I had a meeting at 7 o'clock. And I felt so miserable because I knew the simple distraction of not having the word in front of me, pulling my phone next to me, and going on that was the distraction that Satan used in that moment for me to get my eyes off of the Lord. You don't necessarily need to be with the bottle in your hand to be sinning. Satan can literally use distraction to get your eyes off of the Lord so that your spirit can go down. And how many times do we fall subject to that as a church, right? And there's something I actually tell the boys all the time, and I, I try to do myself. So now when I spend time with the Lord, I put my phone on Do Not Disturb, and I go and I put it on top of my fridge in my kitchen. I don't know why I do it that way. That's just the way it works for me. Because I know absolutely nothing will be able to distract me while I'm with the Lord. Just like he says in Matthew 6, when you go to pray, not if, when you pray, Close the door behind you. Talk to your father and he will be with you. And that's what we got to do. And we look at an example from Matthew chapter 8. And a lot of us know this example where, where Jesus is teaching. And as he's teaching, it says that a, another disciple, I'll read from verse 21. Another of his disciples said to him, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, follow me and allow the dead to bury their own dead. And if you're familiar with Daniel Kalinda, he preaches this on the to- all the time. And his message is, but first. What is your but first in your life? He says, permit me first to go and do this. How many times do we say that? Or permit permit me first to just finish this project I'm working on. Permit me first to get a degree. Permit me first to get married. Permit me first to do the things that I have planned before I actually come to you. And those distractions are what is knocking us down. It's what's killing us spiritually. Maybe it's not necessarily the big sins in our life, but it's the distraction that Satan comes against us with. And what we have to understand is the distraction is a sin. Look what happens in Psalm 31, and I love what David says here. It says, Have mercy on me, Lord, for I am in distress. Tears blur my eyes. My body and soul are withering away. I am dying from grief. My ears are shortened by sadness. Emphasis here. Sin has drained my strength. I am wasted away from within. How many times do we lose our strength from distraction? How many times do we lose our strength from the sin that we're participating in? Where we're no longer passionate, we no longer have desire to read, we no longer have a desire to come into the house of the Lord. So a lot of seats are empty tonight. There's distraction. There's so many other things that we could be doing. And I love how David emphasized this because David is so raw. He's one of those in the Bible that's not scared to talk about how he's feeling. He's not someone that's just going to pretty it up and dress it up and make it look nice. He'll tell you exactly how it is. And sometimes that's what the Lord wants from us. That's why our prayer should be, God, I'm drained. I have no more strength. Fix my eyes back on you. Help me individually. Help me personally. Set my gaze back upon you. 
And he goes on even in Psalm 27. This is actually later in my message, but I want to emphasize this. I love what he says in Psalm 27, uh, verse 4. He says, I want to be in the house of the Lord, gazing upon the beauty of God. Beholding the beauty, in other words. When was the last time we beheld the beauty of the Lord? When was the last time you closed the door in your room and just beheld the beauty of the Lord and put your distractions aside? The only way to get back is through repentance and prayer. The only way to get back is through repentance and through prayer. We cannot put the distractions aside without first admitting that we are distracted, admitting that our eyes are not on Jesus. Many of us, maybe we do have our eyes on Jesus, but not to an emphasis how he wants personal relationship. Listen to this quote from Leonard Ravenhill. It says, no man is greater than his prayer life. The pastor who is not praying is playing. The people who are not praying are straying. We have many organizers, but few agonizers. Many players and payers, but few prayers. Many singers, but few clingers. Lots of pastors, few wrestlers. Many fears, few tears. Much fashion, but little passion. Many interferers, few intercessors. Many riders, but few fighters. Failing here, we fail everywhere. If we're not praying, we're playing. If we're not praying, church, we're straying. If we're not going to be staying in intimacy with the Lord and fixing our eyes on him, there's no point for us to meet here. This is just a show if we don't spend time with the Lord. Yes, we come here to get fed at times, but we also have to give back at times. And that comes from intimacy with the Lord. And many times we come here, and instead of it being like a Thanksgiving dinner where we all have a potluck style to bring in gifts and blessings to bring to the table, we come like a food bank. Where instead one person or two people are handing out food while the others are starving and just receiving. And I just want to emphasize now into the church and into the body of Christ. So we looked at the individual and personal, how we get straight away. And now I want to look at the church and body, how we get straight away. So the first point, individually, we saw ourselves like Samson. We wanted what we wanted. We took our eyes off of the Lord. And now in the church and in the body, we can find ourselves like Martha. We see Martha and Mary, right? Martha, one of them's running in the kitchen. We have plenty of women that do that here, and that's awesome. But there's times to stop there and sit here. I always had a problem with this because I never understood it. I was always on Martha's side. I don't know about you. I was always on her side thinking, like, I I need to prepare. I need to do these things. And it it seems selfish for Mary to just sit down and receive. But what the Lord spoke to me was it wasn't the problem that she was preparing. It was the timing in which she was preparing. It wasn't that she was wrong by preparing. It was the time in which she was preparing. There are times to prepare beforehand so that when you come here, you already are filled to give. Let me read real quick from Luke 10. I'll start from verse 40. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations. She came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good part which shall not be taken from her. I want to emphasize on that. Martha was distracted with her preparations. Church, let me ask you, have you fallen into routine in church? Have you fallen into routine in your place of serving? Have you fallen in preparation at the church, into preparation, doing the things here that you do regularly? Have you fallen into routine with them? Let me ask you something. I'm going to hit a couple topics. Don't be scared. I'm not calling anyone out in the wrong way, but I want to look at a couple things. Worship, word, prayer, and congregation. Worship. As we prepare for worship, do we emphasize more on preparation for worship than we do preparation at home with the Lord? Do we emphasize more preparation on the chords and the right notes and playing great as a band more than we do in our closet alone with the Lord? Do we put practice over our worship? 
Do we put perfection over our worship? And what I mean by that, do we come here, do we try to perfect our sound and perfect what we're doing rather than gazing our eyes on the Lord? In the Word. Do we emphasize a three-point sermon more than we do the Lord? Do we emphasize finding a Greek or Hebrew text or maybe having an awesome quote from some theologian that we can throw into the sermon to make it sound amazing? Do we emphasize on those things more than keeping our eyes on the Lord when we're up here? Do I emphasize more on studying and getting prepared more than I do in prayer and fasting and meditation before I get up here? And look at prayer. And this is not a bad thing because it's biblical. Are we after the gift more than the giver? Are we after the healing more than the healer? Church, I want to emphasize this on, for, on, on us for a second. Where are our eyes fixed on? Are we fixed on the stage? And don't get me wrong, this thing looks amazing. But if Jesus isn't here, I don't care. If Jesus is not with us, then I don't want to be here. If Jesus is not at this pulpit speaking through me, I don't want to speak. If Jesus is not with us in the worship, I don't want to worship. If Jesus isn't listening to my prayer, then I don't want to pray. I want him to hear me, and he's going to hear me if I have a clean heart. Look what's said in Hosea 5. 515. I will return to my place until they admit their guilt and turn to me. For as soon as trouble comes, they will earnestly search for me. As we talked about prayer. Do we go to the Lord for prayer when we need something? And it's like an emphasis saying, like, look, they're going to come search for me when they have problems. How about we search for him when we don't have problems? How about we search for him when everything is going right? How about we search for him when things are going well so that when the time does come, the Lord will bend his ear, no problem, and hear me out. Is there anything wrong with playing skillfully in worship? No. Is there anything wrong with preparing a thorough and concrete message? No. Is there anything wrong with making requests known for healing or, or other things before the Lord? Absolutely not. In fact, the Bible tells us to. But when Jesus has lost his primitive position of absolute attention and attraction, then we have a problem. If Jesus is not the attraction when we're up here, that's when we have the problem. And let me tell you, excellence flows from spiritual well-being. If I'm well off stage, I will be so well on stage. If I'm well in my closet, I will be well at the pulpit. If I'm well in my closet, I will be well in the drum cage. So that when we get here, we don't have to strive for things to go well. They just go well. You guys hear me for a second? If we focus on Jesus... If we fix our eyes on Jesus off stage, out of these seats, in our home, while we are alone with him, this place will erupt. You don't need to put on a show. We don't need to put on the greatest worship. I truly believe we can have the ugliest building in Anaheim. I truly believe all of us can come here dressed casually. And we can stand here and sing in the darkness in acapella, and if we're right with the Lord at home, the power of God will be so much more powerful than any other stage in America. <laughs> Congregation, Bride of Christ, we're beat up every Sunday. We come here hungry. We come here messed up. And like we said, we're supposed to be a potluck, not a food bank. What do you have to offer? What do you have personally to offer to the Lord or to your people here instead of just coming hungry every time? Sometimes we rely on others in the church who have done their spiritual homework and who have spent intimacy time with the Lord and we think that that will suffice our service. Others in the church who have spent time with the Lord, we expect their time with the Lord to suffice for our service that they will be able to withhold it and withstand it, that their intimacy with the Lord will pull down the presence of God. It's not how it works. But when God sees our intimacy and our closeness to him personally, that's when he falls down. That's when he starts moving. That's when he heals. We can take our eyes off of Jesus and place them on routine. 
We get stuck in routine, guys. We get stuck in routine too often. If God is moving in worship, don't preach. If God is moving at the pulpit, don't worship. If God is moving in prayer in the church, stop everything. We don't need to add another song if there's fire going through prayer. We don't need to fill the empty space. What we need to do is say, God, what are you doing? What are you doing in the church right now? Because I want to follow what you're doing. Which means, if the worship was going on stronger tonight than it was already, I wouldn't have to be here because I can say, God, I see you moving more. Does that make sense? That means if God's moving in one direction, let's be still and let's wait on him. Because many times our routine makes us ask, how can I fill Emmanuel? How can I fill the church? How can I fill these empty seats? I'll give you the answer right here. You ready? We don't. The only thing that will bring people to Jesus is more Jesus. Church is empty because many times we are empty. The root issue is that he is not our root. The problem isn't X, Y, or Z. The problem is that he is not our X, Y, or Z. It's that simple. Your intimacy with the Lord will bring the presence of God here. Your intimacy with the Lord will fill the empty seats. Not a service, not the worship, not even the word, not even this pulpit. You can bring the best theologians, the best worshipers, the best speakers, but if the presence of God is not there, the seats will still be empty. That's why I emphasized Psalm 27, 4, and I want to read that one more time. This is one thing I have asked from the Lord, that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, beholding the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. Many of you have kids here. I think I used this example last time. You have a kid, you buy him a toy, what happens in two, three days? They don't want it. We do an amazing song or I bring an awesome message or Fratele Gog or anyone else brings an amazing revelation from the Lord, we're going to be bored in a week. If the Spirit of God is not moving in us personally, how long can I sustain off of that? How long can I sustain off a good service? Revival doesn't begin when the church starts speaking in tongues. Revival starts in each and every person individually. It starts with what you do on your own when no one sees you. And I love what Charles said last week. He said, some people worship in the bathroom. When was the last time you started singing so loud in the shower you annoyed your family? The Spirit of God wrecked you and hit you in that room while the water's running. Revival starts in every person individually. It doesn't start just one gathering where we say, God, come. It starts when I'm walking personally with the Lord and my fire starts going to someone else's fire and starts going to other people. It starts personally when we awaken. Then when we come, God hears us when we pray. Look what Charles Spurgeon says in a quote. Revival begins by Christians getting right first and then it spills over into the world. If we are right first, then after that, revival begins. So I challenge you, church, how about this? This week, go into your room. Maybe you already do this. I'm not saying you don't. But when you're about to walk out, just say, I'm going to stay another 10 minutes, another 10 minutes. Another 15 minutes. Push in. Push into the presence of the Lord. Push into the presence of God and say, God, I have no other distraction. I'm here to behold the beauty of the Lord. And behold his beauty. And you'll see that your sons and daughters will start to see a change in you. Your parents will see the way you're speaking is different. Your church will see the way you worship is different. And when you speak at the pulpit, it's different. Revival begins by Christians getting right first. And then it spills over. So there are times where I'm like Martha. I'm preparing, but there's times where I need to be like Mary and just sit down. We must be ready when we come up, whether we're speaking, playing, praising, whatever it might be. Our eyes should be fixed on him like Mary when we're here because we spent time like Martha when we're home.
And I want to end with a hope or a conclusion. This is my last point. So we saw that how it looks like when we get our distraction off us individually, how we get our eyes off of Jesus as a church sometimes. But now there's a hope and conclusion. We can find ourselves like Peter here. And honestly, this last point is a choice. It's actually your choice to make. You can be like Peter or you can be like Judas. One took his eyes off, both took their, their eyes off of the Lord. Only one repented. Only one turned back. Only one regained his focus on the Lord. And look at those examples I first talked about. So we saw Peter, who was walking on the water, stumbled. But look what happened in John 21. Peter actually took his clothes off when he found out that the Lord was on shore. He jumped into the water and he swam back to Jesus. He put his eyes back on the Lord. Thomas, who was doubting and said, if I don't touch his hands myself, I will not believe. Look what happened to Thomas in John 20 later on in that chapter. Jesus comes again, reveals himself and says, Thomas, come here. Touch my side, touch my hands. And I love it. I think Fratele Gog preached on this, Fratele Druhora, that Thomas was the first one to say, my Lord and my God. He was the first one to declare that Jesus was his own God because his eyes were fixed back on the Lord. Though Peter, though Thomas took their eyes off, they regained their strength. Martha, again in John 12, she gets a chance to serve again, this time without complaining. Samson in Judges 16, he repents. He says, Lord, hear me one last time. He repents before the Lord. And the Lord gives him such power that he kills as many Philistines in that moment than he's done in his whole life. And then we look at Stephen. I gave you an example of Judas who took his eyes off the Lord and didn't come back. But look at Stephen. Stephen kept his eyes on the Lord the whole time up until the point of his stoning. And what did he say? I see the heavens opening before me and Jesus the Lord standing at the right hand of the Father. He kept his eyes on both spiritually and physically on the Lord until the last second. Church, the Lord wants repentance. The Lord wants repentance. Look what's prophesied to Jeremiah chapter 3. It says, therefore, go and give this message to Israel that this is what the Lord says. O Israel, my faithless people, come home to me again, for I am merciful. I will not be angry with you forever. Only acknowledge your guilt. Admit that you rebelled against the Lord your God and that you committed adultery against him by worshiping idols under every green tree. Confess that you refuse to listen to my voice, for I, the Lord, have spoken. God calls us out, but he also calls us to redemption. That's why I love Hosea 5.15. And it said, I will return again to my place until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face. God sometimes leaves us alone until we go back to him, until we acknowledge that we've been making mistakes. We're not perfect. Emmanuel Church, we're not perfect. We make a lot of mistakes, and I'll be the first to say, standing at the pulpit, I make the most mistakes out of any of you here. I probably made mistakes in this sermon as I was speaking. But without repentance, God will not move. Without repentance, God will not start to move deeper in what we want him to move in. I want to give you an example. It was actually from Jonah chapter 3. I was preparing for this message again. And I remember the night before, the Lord told me not to do something. It wasn't anything crazy, but I disobeyed. I was distracted, and I didn't listen to him. And I remember I was starting to read Jonah chapter 3 the next morning, after I was supposed to spend time with the Lord, but I didn't. And in the morning when I started to read the word, the Lord gave me Jonah chapter 3. And I felt so convicted. After I read this, I knew it was the Holy Spirit. Look what it says. When the king of Nineveh heard that Jonah what was saying, he stepped down from his throne and took off his royal robes. He dressed himself in burlap and sat on a heap of ashes. Then the king and his nobles sent a decree throughout the city. No one, not even the animals from your herd and flocks, may eat or drink anything at all. People and animals alike must wear garments of mourning, and everyone must pray earnestly to God. They must turn from their evil ways and stop all their violence. Who can tell? Perhaps even yet God will change his mind, hold back his fierce anger from destroying us. Emphasis on verse 10. When God saw what they had done and how they put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction he had threatened. When I was reading that, it spoke directly to me, so this is what I did. I disobeyed God. I got in my room, I closed the door to spend time with him, and I said, okay, I don't have a sackcloth to put over me. I don't have a pile of ashes to sit on, so I took a towel. Okay? 
I took a towel, I put it over my head, and I started to pray. And while I was praying with this towel over my head, because it's the garment I had that was probably the worst in my room, I started to pray with this garment over my head, and I heard the Lord so clear. He said, stop. I said, what do you mean stop? I just read your word. It told me to cover myself, sit on a pile of ashes, and repent. I'm praying with this towel over my head. The Lord says, stop doing that, because I've seen your heart. I've seen your heart. The actions don't really matter to God. We can put an appearance on, but if our hearts aren't right, nothing matters. So the Lord saw my heart. He told me to stop, and I remember clearly. I said, okay, I'll stop. I felt his touch. I felt his forgiveness. I took the towel off my head. It was cold, so I put on a sweater. And if you've seen this sweater, it's my favorite sweater. It has two words on it. It says, Lord's child. Filou de Mazel, I think. That's how you say it, right? But I put on this Lord's child sweater, and I began praying. And this time when I started to pray, I was about 10 or 15 minutes in, and I felt the presence of God so strong say this. You've taken off my rags and clothed me with joy. If you have Psalm 30, verse 11, please put that up. It spoke so clear to me. You have turned me from my mourning into dancing. You have loosened my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. So this is what I did. It's in the Bible. I flipped. I was like, I got to find this. I know the Lord's speaking to me. I flipped it, landed on Psalm 30, verse 11, exactly. I looked down at the verse and I started crying. You know why? Because the Lord said, I didn't tag you with sad cloth. I stamped you as the Lord's child. And it was so simple. It was a sweater that I wore that God spoke to me and said, you are my son. It was a simple act of repentance through the heart for him to see, I want you. I'm jealous for you. So when you're distracted with other things, I'm jealous for that. Have you gotten to the point in your walk where you can hear the voice of the Lord saying, don't do this because I want intimacy with you? Maybe it's not even a bad thing. Maybe you spend, like me, I love baseball. I know a lot of Romanians don't understand that. But I can spend three and a half hours watching a game, but sometimes I can't spend three and a half minutes reading my Bible. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? That the Lord is jealous for us. The Lord is jealous for the things that we put aside and choose not to follow him for. And he's saying, come back to me in repentance. Choose to sit with me in the quiet, and I will stamp you as the Lord's child. And that's how good God is. God is ready to answer, church. Look at Matthew verse, uh, chapter 7. Ask, and you'll be given. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be answered. The Lord is waiting. Church, he is waiting. He is waiting. He is our groom. He is waiting for us to come to him. He wants us in purity, in repentance, with an open and clean heart to behold the beauty of the Lord and to gaze upon him, not on the distractions of the world. Do you find yourself like Judas or like Peter? Do you repent and come to the Lord and receive that repentance? Or do you find yourself like Judas where he felt bad and ran away? We can find ourselves like Samson. We find ourselves like Martha. We find ourselves like Peter. But if we truly repent, come to him, seek him, gaze our eyes on him, he will meet us. Throughout this whole time preparing, I was thinking of this hymn in my mind. I don't really know hymns. Like, I don't know the verses. I'm sure a lot of us know, like, some melodies of it. But when you get into the, I mean, they're like cantare comun. It's, they're very long. And there's one that stuck out to me, and I kept humming it, and then I went to go look at the lyrics, and it was exactly what was going on. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim. In the light of his glory and grace. Sing that one more time. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full 
in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace lord help us turn our eyes on you it's so simple church fix your eyes on the lord he will meet us he will blow this place up he will fill it up not us he will bring back the prodigals he will bring back the parents he will fill this place he will baptize in the holy spirit he will bring fire with tongues he will bring giftings and fill this place but we must set our eyes on the Lord. Amen.